Um, you know, the importance of the re resurrection of Jesus Christ um, for the Christian faith cannot be overestimated, overemphasized. And it's no exaggeration to say that uh, without the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ, there would be no Christianity. And in fact, it's my uh, firm conviction that without holding fast to this belief of the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ, that Christianity would not, would not even survive. Uh, I've mentioned it before, maybe you've seen it yourself. Uh, several surveys have been done uh, not too long ago, and these surveys tell us that, <clears throat> that Christianity is on the decline in America. Now, mainline Protestant churches in particular have seen a dramatic decline in their church attendance. Now, if you're not sure what mainline Protestants are, Protestant churches, they're basically divided up in th into three categories. There's the mainline churches, the, there's the evangelical churches, and there's the charismatic churches. And uh, we are a Southern Baptist church, and that puts us in the, uh, the uh, evangelical uh, camp as a Southern Baptist church. Uh, now, the attendance in the evangelical churches have pretty much stayed steady. Uh, over the last several decades. That has not changed that much. So when it talks about the decline in Christianity and the, the decline in the intent, attendance of churches, Christian churches, that is basically accounted for by the decline in the mainline churches uh, more than anything else. And so it has been that, that dramatic. But, um, now, uh, but the point here is that uh, the drop in the churches uh, the so-called drop is very narrowly focused uh, here in the United States. Now, one of the key differences between uh, mainline churches and uh, other Protestant churches is that the mainline churches, they tend to be more liberal, uh, more liberal in their theology. Uh, the largest mainline churches in the United States are the uh, Presbyterian Church USA, PC USA. There are several Presbyterian churches. The PC USA is one of the largest uh, their mainline church, the United Methodist Church, is a mainline church. They're a very large denomination uh, as well. They're a mainline church. The Episcopalians are mainline churches, and uh, as well as the American Baptists. We're Southern Baptists, but there's a, another Baptist branch called the American Baptist. They tend to be mainline as well. Of course, this isn't a hard and fast rule. There's a spectrum of, of these beliefs, but these are the general categories that we look at when we're looking at the, at the Protestant churches. But uh, the point is, there's the mainline churches, which tend to be more liberal. We're part of the evangelical branch, which tends to be uh, more, um, more conservative. Uh, so there's this... Uh, a company called Lifeway, which is part of the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, and there's a researcher there. His name is Ed Stetzer. He's the main researcher at Lifeway. Uh, he says this about the decline of the mainline churches in America. He said, over the past few decades, decades, some mainline Protestants have abandoned central doctrines that were deemed offensive to the surrounding culture. Jesus literally died for our sins and rose from the dead. The view of the authority of the Bible, the need for personal conversion, and other things as well. The future of mainline Protestantism is connected to Christianity's essential past. Essential past being the key word there. Uh, where the resurrection can be proclaimed again unabashedly. Jesus is not just a good person who suffered unjustly, which tends to be the general attitude of people who attend mainline churches, that Jesus is just a good person as a good example for us who suffered unjustly. Jesus' death and resurrection makes our dead souls alive again, literally. Uh, in main, mainline Protestantism, if mainline Protestantism has a future, it will need to engage deeply with the past, not the past of an idealized 1950s, but one that is 2,000 years old, meaning from the very start of the church. The early Christians saw a Savior risen from the dead, heard a message that said he was the only way, and, the, and read scriptures that teach truths out of step with culture, both then and now. Christianity has always been against the grain of culture, and it should be. If it's not against the grain of culture, then probably there's something wrong uh, with our brand of Christianity, at least until Jesus comes back. Once Jesus comes back, we'll all be Christians, and we'll all be in sync together uh, with the grain of culture as it may be. But before Jesus comes back, Christianity is always going to be uh, against the grain of culture. And so uh, the climax and the heart 
of the story of God's great plan of salvation for the world uh, that we find in scriptures in the Bible is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, Christ is the, the main event uh, of the Bible. If the resurrection is false, well, the Apostle Paul, he puts it this way. He says, and if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. <laughs> I may as well go home, play some golf. And Paul and I will go out and shoot around the golf together, maybe, if, if, his wife, if his wife lets him in, if CJ lets him in. That's a terrible joke. I'm sorry. Um, and then he goes on to say, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, meaning the resurrection of Jesus Christ gives us hope for eternal life. If only for this life uh, we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. That's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I don't know what that says about me. But if we do not believe in the eternal life that we have in Jesus Christ, then we of all people on this planet are most to be pitied. But if the resurrection of Jesus Christ is true... And there are some deep and powerful implications about that. That means that everything that Jesus said and everything that Jesus claimed about himself and the world, about God and people, is, is true. And that's why Easter, this is why Easter is the most important Sunday on the Christian calendar, Resurrection Sunday, as we say. So on this Resurrection Sunday, we're looking at the Gospel of Matthew, and our passage is going to tell us one powerful and important truth is that Jesus is alive and Jesus is alive right now amen oh I'm liking it already much much more thank you very much so let's read this passage together Matthew chapter 28 verses 1 through 10 Verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, meaning Jesus' mother, went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were, like, were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be, be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, Galilee. There they will see me. And this is the word of God. Very familiar story, I think, for, for many, many of us. Um, so today, what I want to do is I want to take a look at the resurrection of Jesus through the eyes of of the first witnesses, who are, who are the women. Uh, and I want to look at three things. I want to look at what they saw, I want to look at what they heard, and then I want to look at whom they meet. Okay, first of all, what they saw. Verse, verse 1, it begins, After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Now, what, what is it they were expecting to see? They went to go look at the tomb. What is it that they were expecting to see? Well, they went to go look at the tomb because they wanted to go figure out how to open the tomb, roll away the stone. And they wanted to uh, figure out how to open the tomb because they wanted to go inside to see the dead corpse of Jesus so that they could finish uh, embalming the body because they had to do it in a rush and they didn't have time to fully uh, anoint him. So they wanted to finish the work of uh, anointing his body with perfumes and spices. So they go to look at the tomb, wondering how they're going to open it. And lo and behold, how do you like that for King James English? Lo and behold, what do they see? The tomb is already open and the large stone in front of it is rolled away. And who rolled away the stone? Well, an angel did it. 
He came down from heaven. He caused this huge earthquake as he was coming down. He rolled away the stone. And after he rolled away the, away the stone, he sat on it as if to say, yep, I'm the one who rolled away the stone. And so you better listen to what I'm about to tell you right now. Because I'm the one who rolled away this stone. So you better listen to me right here and right now. And uh, not only do they see that the, the stone has been rolled away uh, and an angel uh, sitting on top of it, they see the guards there. They're probably scattered around. And it says that uh, they became like dead men. So apparently they had uh, fainted when they saw the angel just out of fear. They, <laughs> they swooned these, these Roman guards. They were so scared of this angel. And so this is kind of comical and, and ironic, uh, really. Here are two women. Uh, they're expecting to see Jesus' Jesus's dead body and these living guards because they, they watched them close up the tomb. And so they knew that the guards were there. They went to the tomb expecting to see Jesus' dead body and these living guards, but that's not what they see. In fact, they see something more like the complete opposite. They don't see Jesus' dead body. But what they see are the guards who are like dead men, the living guards who are like dead men. And if I were to sort of spiritualize this a bit, I would say that we don't see Jesus among the dead. We don't see Jesus among the dead. We see Jesus among the people who were once dead, but are now alive in him. We don't see Jesus among dead people. And that's why people who are alive in Jesus, they go to the dead people to share the gospel of Jesus Christ so that they too can become alive and so that Jesus would be seen in them as well. You see, the guards, they were posted there. The guards were posted there so that no one would come to steal the body of Jesus. The chief priests, uh, the chief priests of the Jews, they had heard rumors uh, of Jesus' claim to resurrection and they were afraid that the disciples would come and steal the body of Jesus. So they placed guards there so that no one would steal the body. So uh, later when they told the chief priests what had happened... The chief priests, they paid the guards a large amount of money to say that they fell asleep. That they fell asleep and then the, and then the, the disciples that they came uh, to steal the body. So the chief priests, they posted guards there so that the disciples would not make up a story about Jesus' resurrection. But they're the ones who ended up making up the story because they refused to believe that Jesus could actually have been resurrected. They refused to believe that Jesus is indeed alive. And why is that? Well, it's because their hearts were dead. Their hearts were dead. You cannot see Jesus among the dead hearts. You only see Jesus among those who were once dead, but now, now alive in him. So seeing Jesus, it is a matter of faith. And I'm not talking about blind faith here. I'm talking about a reasonable faith. You know, there's, it's no secret. If you, if you read all of the Gospels, and you can probably do that in one sitting. It wouldn't take too long. If you read all of the Gospels, especially the resurrection accounts, you see very clearly there's, there's a lot of differences between those different Gospel accounts. And if your heart is dead in faith, you will not see Jesus if your heart is dead in faith, all you will see are the differences between those gospel accounts, and you will see those differences as being contradictions in the Bible, contradictions in the resurrection story. Now, there are some really, really obvious, obvious differences here. For example, in Mark, we read about three women instead of two. There's the two Marys, and then there's Salome, who is the mother of James and John. In the Gospel of John, we only read about one of the women, Mary Magdalene. It sounds like she's alone there. In Luke, there are two angels instead of uh, the one angel uh, in the other Gospels. And there's a lot of differences that you could point out. And it would be very easy to say, look at here. 
They're different. These eyewitness accounts are different and they contradict one another. But if you examine the differences really carefully, really carefully, even if you are a non-believer and a skeptic, you see that none none of these differences uh, absolutely contradict one another. And this is what is really significant about this. These differences, which are really just different perspectives on the same event, They're not contradictions. They're different perspectives on the same event. It actually highlights the authenticity of the gospel accounts. Let me say that again. The differences that we read here in the different gospels, it actually highlights the authenticity of the different gospel accounts. In other words, these differences highlights the fact that no one tried to make it up. No one tried to reconcile all these stories and make it say the same thing. You know, it's like when uh, the people, when the police are trying to investigate some kind of uh, crime, they bring in eyewitnesses for questioning. And uh, all the eyewitnesses, what they generally do is they tell different stories about the same event. Now, if all the eyewitnesses or a group of eyewitnesses eyewitnesses were telling the exact same story. Let's even say that they were all together in the same exact spot with the same exact perspective on the crime. If all those eyewitnesses said the exact same thing, the police would know that they made it up, which would mean that they're probably the criminals, right? Because that just never happens. Everybody has a different perspective on the same story and the same event, and it'll... It may even sound like they contradict each other a little bit, but the police know. The police know when the stories are different, that verifies the authenticity of the stories that they're telling, as long as they, don't not, they do not absolutely contradict one another. And the gospel accounts, they do not absolutely contradict one another. And don't let anyone ever tell you that they do. But when our heart is dead in faith, We only see the differences and the contradictions. And we can't see Christ in the text. And we can't see Christ in our lives. It's only when your heart is open to a reasonable faith, not a blind faith, to a reasonable faith that you can see the truth and you can see Christ in your life. The second thing, what they heard So, the body of Jesus is gone, and that's a very mysterious thing. Where the heck did it go? You know, in the Gospel of John, Mary thinks that somebody took the body. She thinks that the the caretaker took the body. But the angel explains to them what that means, his missing body. First of all, his missing body means that he's dead. He tells them in verse 5 that Jesus was indeed crucified. In other words, he was dead. If Jesus never died, there was no resurrection. And if there's no resurrection, once again, game over for Christianity. Game over. And not only that, the angel tells them that he has risen. Now, now technically, Jesus didn't raise himself. Uh, God raised him from the dead. And then finally, uh, the angel tells them uh, that... uh, tells them things that only Jesus and his disciples would have known. He tells them uh, the fact that Jesus had told them that he would be resurrected. As he had told you, he is raised from the dead. And he also told them, gave them the instructions that Jesus had given them before he went to the cross of going up to Galilee where he would meet them once again. So the evidence that Jesus was resurrected not, was not just the missing body, But the testimony of the angel, the angel tells them what happened and the angel tells them what is about to happen. Uh, Now, the fact that the body of Jesus is missing, it's really significant for another reason, too, Uh, because uh, what that means is that it's not just the spirit of Jesus that is alive, right? It's not just the spirit of Jesus that's alive. His body was missing, which tells us it's that his body is alive too. Jesus was resurrected in his body, soul, and spirit. 
And the Gospels make it very clear to us that Jesus and his entire person was resurrected from the dead. But what that really means for us, and, and why that is important for us, is that th that tells us that our bodies, our body, soul, and spirit will be resurrected when Jesus comes back as well. I remember one time, a long time ago, there was this brother I was talking to. He had gone to church all his life. And I mentioned to him about the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ and the bodily resurrection of Jesus' followers and his disciples. And he had never heard that before. Well, probably because he had been going to a mainline church all his life. And they talk about the spiritual matters and not the literal matters of the gospel accounts. Jesus was bodily resurrected, which means that we will be bodily resurrected as well. So the Apostle Paul, he wrote this. He said, so will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory, the body. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Once again, he's talking about the body. The body is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. And this point uh, about the spiritual body, uh, he is saying that the spiritual body, there is a physical attribute to it. That's why he calls it a body and not just a spirit. There is a physical attribute to this spiritual body. And that, I don't know if you think about these things, but that's a great, great mystery that's sort of beyond our comprehension, at least for me. But Paul, uh, earlier, he describes it as like a seed, right? That has one body, and when it gets planted, it germinates, and it grows to whatever kind of plant it is, and it becomes another kind of body, right? And I think of it in terms of a caterpillar. I don't know if you've ever seen those fast motion uh, uh, videos of a caterpillar being born. So it starts out as, uh, not a caterpillar, but a butterfly being born. You know, the caterpillar weaves a cocoon around itself, and then somehow it becomes this completely different thing, a butterfly. And we can also think of it in terms of humanity itself, right? I don't mean to be uh, crass here, but you know, sperm and egg come together, two different kinds of bodies. They form a fetus, a completely different body. It becomes a baby, and then it grows up to be a child. It grows up to be a teenager, and then a young adult, and then a fatter adult, and then a really fat middle-aged adult, and then finally, an older and shorter single adult or senior adult. How does that happen? I don't know. But all of these are different bodies with the same spirit. Why is that? So it's not very difficult to imagine this spiritual body that happens with the resurrection. We see it all around us all the time. So... It is the testimony that the women hear from the angel that explained what they saw. Or actually, it explained what they didn't see, which was they didn't see the body of Jesus Christ because his body had been resurrected. And the testimony of the angel also confirmed what, the Jesus, what Jesus had told his disciples before he went to the cross of uh, going up to Galilee and uh, meeting him and also that he would be resurrected. But... When you think about this, even if you have just a crazy, crazy encounter like this, meeting an angel, right? Just think about this for a second. You have this crazy experience. Let's say that you're the one who meets the angel, and this angel tells you all this stuff. That's still just circumstantial evidence. I don't know where you are spiritually, but depending on where I am spiritually, I could have just been sinning like five minutes earlier, and I'd be like, oh my gosh, is this angel actually the devil trying to trick me? You know, kind of thing. Who knows? But in faith, I believe when Jesus comes, I will know it, because he'll let me know. So don't worry about that. But it's still just circumstantial evidence, because they were told about Jesus' resurrection, but they didn't actually... See it, the real proof of the resurrection is yet to come, right? And that's the final point, whom they meet, whom they meet. So verse 8 says that after the angel told them these things, 
They ran to tell the other disciples, and they were feel, filled with fear, and they were filled with joy. And their reaction, it basically tells us that they believed the testimony of the angel. They believed what the angel said, and then they obeyed the angel's instructions. In other words, the women, they responded in faith and obedience to the circumstantial evidence of what they saw and heard. And what they saw and heard was basically the seed of the gospel message, the heart of the gospel message of Jesus' resurrection and that he is alive. And so, as they're on their way, whom should they run into? Whom should they meet? But Jesus, Jesus himself, right? And Jesus is like, hello, <laughs> hi, hi there, what's up? Can you imagine when Jesus comes back in his glory? He'll come riding on the clouds, like it says, you know, in power and glory, thunder and lightning all around, the hosts of heaven just in his train, ready to come down, make everything right, and restore everything to the way it should be, and give us the new heaven and a new earth. And Jesus says, Hi, what's up? <laughs> I think I would respond the exact same way that these women did. It'd be like face down, planted, kissing the earth, reaching out for Jesus' feet, worshiping him with my heart, soul, strength, and mind. Man, I can't wait. Now, if I were to spiritualize this, I would say that Jesus meets us when we step out in faith and obedience. I don't know if you've ever experienced that in your own life, but I experience that in my life all the time. It's when we step out in faith and obedience, that's where Jesus meets us. That's where Jesus meets us. I think all of you here know about the Great Commission, right? The Great Commission this year, the theme is to be disciples and make disciples, right? And that comes from the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You know, I can teach you about the Great Commission, but Jesus doesn't want to just teach you about the Great Commission. Jesus wants to teach us the Great Commission. You know what I'm saying? He doesn't want us to just learn about the Great Commission. He wants us to learn the Great Commission. And we learn the Great Commission when we step out in faith and obedience and do what the Great Commission actually says to do. And when we do that, what happens? The promise of the Great Commission, I am surely with you always, to the very end of the age. Hello. Hi. What's up, Jesus? Here I am. Here I am. When we step out in faith and obedience. I'm wondering, do you see and experience Jesus in your life? Do you? I think a lot of people, when they talk to me, they say, I'm just really spiritually dry. I don't, my heart is just so hard right now. I don't see Jesus. I don't experience Jesus in my life. And it's my belief and it's my conviction and it's my observation actually that when people get to that point when people get there it's because they see Jesus in a wrong light the way that they see Jesus is simply as a source of personal healing personal counseling and personal blessing and there's nothing wrong with that I'm not saying that that's wrong because I cry out to Jesus all the time. And when I cry out to Jesus, I expect him to respond to my pleas, 
And he does. He does. But if that is the only thing that you are doing, if that's the only way that you relate to Jesus, I have a feeling, brothers and sisters, that sooner or later you will get dry and you will not see Jesus anymore because Jesus is our healer. He is. He is our counselor. He really is. But more than anything, more than anything, what is Jesus? First and foremost, Jesus is a missionary. He was sent by God. Jesus is a missionary. And if you're not seeing Jesus, it's because you're not on mission with Jesus. Yeah, when you call upon him, he will come to you. But he's saying, come with me. Come with me. So, the other thing that I want to point out about this, and this is, this kind of blew my mind too. Did you notice that what Jesus said to the women, what is that? It's basically the exact same thing that the angel said, isn't it? Pretty much. Almost word for word, as a matter of fact. And I got to thinking about that. And so, when I encounter Jesus in my life, I wonder, is he going to tell me something different from what the testimony of Scripture has already told me? I don't think so. He might remind me what the testimony of Scripture says, but I don't think he's going to tell me anything different. It's like this angel. He told them, this is going to happen. And this is what happened. And Jesus said, this is what's going to happen, and this is what happened. And I think that's the same with us as well. When we encounter Jesus, he reminds us of the things that we already know, that he has told us already through Scripture. Now, when Jesus comes back and we become perfected, as they say, coming face to face with him, I'm sure we'll just have some revelations that we never, we never realized before. And I'm, I'm anticipating uh, eagerly that moment as well. But here in this life, do we need any new revelation than what's given here? I don't think so. And so when Jesus comes to us, what he says is right there. But the other thing is this. other thing is this. There is a slight difference between what Jesus said and what the angel said in there. It's that Jesus said, go tell my brothers. Isn't that crazy? Go tell my brothers. And we don't want to leave the sisters out of here, out of this either. Because I wasn't sure if I was going to say this, but I think Gloria kind of encouraged me to. No, now she's regretting that she told me to. But I'm going to say it and I'm going to embarrass you, Gloria. Okay, can I do that? Sure. <laughs> the women. Jesus first told the women. They were the first ones who received the revelation of his resurrection. Now, that's really significant. Now, if you've ever heard uh, sermons about this before, and I don't want to be patronizing here, okay? You know what patronizing means? Patronizing means, yeah, I'm the man. I'm the one with all the power. So, uh, Gloria, good job, little sister. You know, and I can say that because I'm the man with all the power, right? I don't mean to be patronizing here to the sisters because I sincerely authentically believe that without the sisters there would be no church Amen. <laughs> seriously and when the sisters struggle in any church guess what your church is gonna struggle like crazy right but I'm not saying that because we're struggling I mean everybody struggles to a certain degree but for the most part, we're a healthy church. But I'd want to encourage you guys, both sisters and brothers, to please be mindful of the females in this church and encourage them, encourage them, support them, right? Help them as they need because they are like a vital backbone to the church and the ministry. You know what they did for Jesus? These are the women who ministered to him throughout his entire ministry. They ministered to Jesus. Right? And that's what women do. 
They minister to the men. They minister to Jesus. So please remember that. Okay? But anyway, I got off on a tangent. I'm sorry. Brothers and sisters. He calls us brothers and sisters. Now Jesus, he put it another way in, in the Gospel of John. He said, I no, no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. And this comes back to the fact that Jesus is a missionary again. What he's saying here is that when we join him, when we participate with him in God's great plan of salvation for the world, he calls us friends. He calls us brothers and sisters. Because then we know the Father's will. We know what Jesus is doing because that's what we're doing. We're doing what Jesus is doing. We're friends of Jesus. We're brothers and sisters of Jesus. One last point about this, and I'm going to close up. All right? Jesus, Jesus, he calls us brothers and sisters. He calls us friends. Now, the difference between Jesus and me is a whole lot greater than the difference between me and you, isn't it? I mean, who, in this room, who is the person that is farthest from me? Probably Elizabeth, right? Yeah. She's so cute. I remember when she was born. That was awesome. But the difference between me and Elizabeth is nothing compared to the difference between me and Jesus. Yet he calls me brother. Brother. And if Jesus calls me brother... Shouldn't I call you brothers and sisters? Shouldn't I have this attitude that you are my brothers and sisters? Shouldn't I love you as my family, as my brothers and sisters in him? Should we not? Blew me away. Sometimes I impress myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> I want to make an appeal to you just out of all this, one application for today. Join a mission trip. There's still room for the Zambia team, and you can go to Turkey as well. There's a, one spot available for Turkey also. You don't have to go to, I can't go to Turkey, which is why there's one spot available. But come to Zambia and go to Turkey. You won't regret it. I guarantee. And based upon what Jesus tells us, as brothers and sisters, he'll be there when we go out. Right? So that's my appeal to you uh, for today. So in closing, let me just say, Jesus is alive. <laughs> Jesus is alive, and he wants to be alive in you. We've seen and we've heard the testimony. We've seen and we've heard. So let's go meet him. Amen. Amen. Let's come to the Lord in prayer.